read the scriptures collectively tonight. Um, we can read verses 1, Philippians chapter 1, verse 1 down to, to verse 11. I can, I'll start off on verse 1 to get uh, our start and then you can join in from verse 2 and following as we read the scriptures. The Word of God reads, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in, all pr in every prayer of mine for you all making request with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defence and confirmation of the gospel, ye, are, ye all are partakers of my grace. For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offence till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ, unto the glory and praise of God. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Tonight, thank you for reading along with me. I know that's not what we normally do, but it's nice to read the scriptures together. Let's pray before we consider the text before us tonight. Heavenly Father, we pray that you might minister the truth of your word to us. May your spirit illuminate us and, and lead us in truth. And I pray that, that as we consider what the Apostle Paul penned those years ago under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I pray that they were maybe living and powerful words to us tonight and that we may be challenged to pray in a similar way to the Apostle Paul, that we may have a heart and a desire to grow uh, just like the believers at Philippi needed to grow. I pray that you would help me to preach uh, and to be clear as I expound the scriptures, help us to take the message that you would have for us tonight and apply it we, uh, we don't want to be known as those who hear the word but fail to do. And I pray that we might be obedient to the challenges that you may lay before us tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so the book of Philippians, we continue our verse-by-verse verse study. And we mentioned in our early messages that the main point of the book of Philippians is, is the concept of walking in joy. Paul is writing to a group of believers who, it seems had lost some of their joy as Christians and were facing circumstances that was, were causing them to lose their sight or take their, their focus away from Jesus Christ. And Paul writes from a prison cell or indeed under house arrest and teaches believers through the book of Philippians what it is to walk in joy in the midst of difficulty and adversity. And last time we began looking at verses 1 through to 11, and we didn't finish this, these opening verses. We, we saw the greeting or the salutation in verses 1 and 2. And we, we looked at some, some of the things there. We also saw his thanksgiving from verse 3 down to verse 8. And tonight, Lord willing, we will finish off this opening section by considering Paul's prayer. Paul's prayer for the believers at Philippi. You can see that he had a great love for these brothers and sisters. In verse 3, just to remind you of his, his uh, mind of thanksgiving, we read that he thanked his God. Paul said, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making a request with joy. Paul writes to them about his delight in praying for them and interceding for them. He writes that he is, is rejoicing over all of them. He says he's thanking his God upon every remembrance of you, praying for you all and making requests with joy. Why was Paul delighted 
with the church at Philippi. Do you remember? So, well, maybe the Williamsons weren't here, so that may be hard. It was because they were a church who faithfully supported him in the ministry. They had begun supporting him early days and they continued right through and Paul was confident that their, their support would continue. And it was not just a prayerful support or a, an emotional support, it was a financial support to the point where Paul, when he's giving thanks for them, says that they were partakers with him in the ministry, that they were involved with him, they had fellowship with him. You see the word in verse 5, fellowship, and the word partaker in verse 7 mean the same thing. It's to join together in the work. And Paul was saying, because you supported me, because you, you enabled me, you are partakers of, of the grace of God, partakers of the grace that God bestowed upon Paul in his ministry. The Philippians had a part in that. So when Paul was making a defence for the gospel, confirming the truth when he's in prison, in the palace, wherever he goes, the Philippians had a hand in that because they supported him. So we talked about that. Um, we saw that we need to, last time, probably one of the main applications was we need to be careful who we, we financially support because we become partakers with them in the ministry and whether they're serving the Lord or whether they are serving self or even perverting the gospel, we become, we become partakers or we fellowship with them either in their good deeds as under the Lord or their evil deeds and it's important that we have discernment with who we support but tonight I'd like for us to look from ver at verse 9 and following down to verse 11 and ask ourselves, what can we learn from Paul's prayer? What can we learn from Paul's prayer? And I mentioned there are six elements to what Paul prays here in verses 9 through to 11. The general concept, the overarching thought in Paul's mind as he prays is that he wants to see these believers grow in their sanctification. He wants to see them grow in their love, in their knowledge, in their discernment, in their bearing of fruit. He wants these believers to grow. Right? And then there are six elements to that growth that I'd like for us to look at tonight. Paul is praying for their continued sanctification. So I ask myself, even before we embark in and look at some of these, these six elements to Paul's prayer, I kind of ask myself and I'd like to ask you, when you pray for brothers and sisters in the Lord, are you praying that they would grow in their faith? Is that the focus of your prayer? Oftentimes we pray for our brothers and sisters that the Lord might bring healing to them because oftentimes that's the thing that is asked a lot. People are sick, people are facing adverse circumstances, they're going through trials, they're facing difficulty and we as believers intercede in those areas and that's good. I mean, we are to pray for the sick. The Bible instructs us to pray for the sick. The Bible also instructs us to bear one another's burdens. And when brothers and sisters are going through difficult times, it's good to support them in prayer and to pray for the Lord's work to be done. But I hope that's not the end of our prayers for, for brothers and sisters. I, I hope that our prayers are a bit like Paul's prayer and we have a desire to see one another grow and we pray to that end. When you pray for yourself... What do you pray for? Do you pray that you would grow in sanctification, that you would, you would grow in love, in discernment, in knowledge, in, in um, what's he say here, approving things which are excellent? Do you, do, you, do you pray along these lines that we're going to look at tonight, even for yourself as a believer? Because there's some pretty plain and obvious application for us. When we look at the way Paul prayed, we can ask ourselves, do I pray like this? And am I burdened with the same things that burdened Paul? He had a love for these brothers and sisters and that led him to pray along these lines. And that's, that's a good example. So these six things. Firstly, we see it in verse 9 that Paul prayed that their love may abound. He prayed for an abounding love. Verse 9 says, and this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. We'll take that latter part of the verse in a moment, but let's focus on the first part, Paul's prayer that their love may abound. 
we know that the church at Philippi loved Paul and he loved them. This is true because Paul says that he has them in his heart. There is a wonderful, rich and genuine appreciation for one another that's seen in the early part of the book of Philippians. It, it kind of seeps off the page. There is a great affection there between the apostle and this church, but Paul prays that their, their love may abound. Now, it's not just that their love may abound for Paul, but their love may abound for one another, that it may be a, a horizontal love between brethren, but I think also that it, it is a prayer that their love for the Lord may in, abound too. So a vertical love and a horizontal love. The Philippians had a lot of love and they showed it to Paul, but Paul wants them to abound in it. The word abound is, it's a nice word in this context. It means to, to exceed a fixed measure. Um, it's a bit like when you've got a measuring cup that is 250 mils and you're trying to you're trying to measure more than the measure will allow, right? More than you can fit in the cup. It abounds beyond the realm of measurement. And you might say, how much water is that? Well, I don't know. It's more than I can measure. That's the idea, abounding love, beyond our ability to measure. Um, Clark says this, that our love in this context, this abounding love may be like a river, perpetually fed with rain and fresh streams so that it continues to swell and increase until it fills all its banks and floods the adjacent plains. You wouldn't think that flooding rivers sound like a good thing, but that's the picture where the waters flow in abundance through the river so that the plains are watered and, and fed. Um, this is the kind of love that Paul is praying for. I pray that your love may grow, may abound in this way. Uh, but love without truth is a dangerous thing, isn't it? Paul doesn't just say, oh, you need to be growing in love for everyone and for God. And I know some people emphasise love at the expense of truth, but Paul doesn't. Paul goes on to say in his prayer that their love may abound more and more in knowledge. In knowledge. The second thing that he prays for is that these believers would walk in truth and love, which is, that's borrowing language from John, doesn't it? You remember 2 John? Second John, he's writing to believers and he's saying, you know, I love that you're walking in truth. And in fact, turn over to Second John just quickly and we'll, we'll see his commentary here, his exhortation and the cause for his delight. Uh, verse 3. says, grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth as we have received a commandment from the Father. And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love that we walk after his commandments. You see, there's a, an association between truth and love that ought not be broken if you don't have both both are corrupted. If, if, you have, if you neglect one element, then the other is corrupted. And Paul is praying for knowledge here. It's the word gnosis. It's not just truth per se, but it's, it's knowledge. Um, epinosis or, epi, or, or gnosis itself is speaking about knowledge. And you might say, well, that's just information, um, knowing stuff. But when the Scriptures talk about knowledge, it means more than just information. It's not just Paul wasn't just praying for these believers that they would, they would know more stuff. Right? He's not saying you need to love more and you need to know more um, about the Lord and about, about one another. And he's not saying you need to, to know more of the Scriptures necessarily, but when the Bible uses the word knowledge, it's particularly epignosis. epignosis. It, it's, it's a knowledge gained by experience. It's a, it's a knowledge that we we grow through and we, we know by intimate relationship. It's a knowledge by experience. This is a practical love, not just based on book knowledge, but by experience of lives with one another and with the Lord. The Bible uses the phrase between Adam and wife, that Adam knew his wife, Eve, and she bare a son. And, and that 
conveys more than information. It's um, an intimate union. It's, a, it's an, an experience, the most intimate of all, between husband and wife. But, and that's not what it's talk about here, but it gives us an idea of what it means to know by experience, to the closeness and the intimacy. Paul is praying for these believers that they may have a love that grows in knowledge through experience with God and with others, that horizontal love between brethren and that vertical love for the Lord. This love that he's praying for is not just one that needs to abound and one that needs to be governed by truth, but also we see it in verse 9 that his prayer is that they would grow in judgment. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. That means discernment. He's asking that they would be discerning in their love, discerning in their behaviour, that 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 may govern them. Um, And it is somewhat similar to the attitude of the Bereans who were more noble than those in Thessalonica, who received the word with readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. There was a, a discernment there. There are ministries that we see, um, particularly when you drive around on a Friday night. Um, I head home from youth group uh, probably around 9.30, getting towards 10 o'clock sometimes, and you see social ministries at the parks. Fishers of men come to mind, but I don't want to name people unnecessarily, but there are uh, other ministries out there which are seeking to minister in a loving way to people, but perhaps it's not based on knowledge And I don't know that it's based on discernment, but Paul's prayer is for believers to grow in discerning knowledge by experience type love for one another and for God, just like John spoke of in 2 John. Have a think. Paul knew the danger of an undiscerning love, didn't he? Paul was no stranger to challenges in ministry. Can you think of a church that really really gave him a run for his money. I think the church at Corinth, to be honest. Um, Problems after problems after problems. And Paul wrote to them, rebuking them, because, and you read it, you can turn there to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and we we can see this church was struggling with a lack of discernment about what was right and what was wrong and what was loving, what was true. 1 Corinthians 5 I'll read you the verses, verses 1 through to 7, describe for us uh, a terrible situation within the church, but lest you focus so much on the fornication, the worst part is in verse 2. But verse 1 says this, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he might that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you for verily as absent for I verily as absent in the body but present in the spirit have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ when ye are gathered together and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, and ye, as ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. This is a description of an awful sin. All sin is awful, by the way. So let's acknowledge that to begin with. But this is a sin that was not even named among the Gentiles and the church was, was turning a blind eye to it. But verse 2 gives you the impression that they were, they were puffed up and proud in it rather than, rather than mourning. And Paul writes saying, you're puffed up. And later on in verse 6, I think it was, he says, your glorying is not good. It almost gets the, oh, we're glorying in ourselves but we're condoning this kind of behaviour. They had a, a love that was not based, uh, was not growing in discernment. You would agree with that? Paul sees the danger in it and he prays that the Philippians might have a love that is governed by discernment. 
Let's move on. He's mentioned love that needs to be abounding, that he wants to be abounding in knowledge and in judgment. Verse 10, that you may approve things that are excellent. This is the fourth of the sixth, the fourth of six. That you may approve things that are excellent. Paul's prayer is that he wants these believers to be able to distinguish not just between what is good and bad, or what is good and better, but from better to best. He wants them to know what is best. The word approve means to recognise as genuine after examination. And sometimes it means to prove or to test. He says that you might test which things are excellent, that you might that you might recognise things that are excellent, as excellent, after you've tested them, to deem them worthy. Paul wants believers to put things to the test. Paul's desire is that they will determine what is of God and what is of the flesh and that they will choose to go God's way. We need to follow that example. Not everything that walks into the church claiming to be Christian is Christian. You would agree with that? Not everything that we read or hear or or is preached is true to God's Word and we must be discerning and we must be proving. We must be testing the things and declaring what is excellent, what is best. Um, Paul will go on in Philippians to tell us how to do that. Philippians 4 verse 8 has been described by preachers as a grid through which we ought to look. A bit like when you sieve something and you bits fall through and then bad bits get caught and they, they get thrown out. I remember spending many hours sieving kikuyu grass out of a garden bed with a drum sieve like this big and I every single shovel fall. Shake, 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 shake and throwing out all of the roots. Some, that's what I think of when I read Philippians 4.8. I think of, is this the grid? Am I, is this going to fit through? Is this allowed? What does Philippians 4 verse 8 say? Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Verse 9 says, those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do and the God of peace shall be with you. If it doesn't fit through that grid, get rid of it. Like, and I know that garden bed did okay for a while, but inevitably, guess what happened? I let some kaikyu through, (laughs) and it had devastating effects. We need to be careful. And approving, testing and seeing what is excellent, and Paul will explain later exactly how to do that. If you look at the end of verse 10, Philippians 1 verse 10, he says that you may approve things that are excellent for what, to what end? Why do we need to be as Christians discerning and, and approving the things that are, are best that you may be sincere and without offence till the day of Christ? That we may be sincere and without offence. Sincere means to be honest, upright of heart, uh, to be single-eyed, you know, to, to not be double-minded or be looking left and right, but to be single in our vision and fixed in our heart, to be sincere. Um, the second part of this description is to be without offence, which is to be blameless. Um, it can convey that idea or to be without offence before God and without offence before men, an inoffensive person. And you might say, but wait a minute, I thought these believers were already blameless in the sight of the Lord, that they they already were. And and what Paul, I I mentioned, he's praying for their sanctification, for their growth, and that their practical day-in, day-out life would match who they are as Christians. He's asking them or asking God that that God would work in this way, that these believers may be sincere and without offence till the day of Christ, that they may be outwardly who they are inwardly. They, their, their outer condition might reflect their spiritual standing before the Lord. To what end? That in the day of Christ they may be 
unto his glory and praise. Um, Till the day of Christ, I think, is a reference to the Bema Seat judgment of Christ. Um, I think that this is a reference to the time where believers will stand before the Lord and he will reward or not reward believers on the basis of their works. Um, Turn over to 1 Corinthians 13 just for a reminder of the passage there. Um, This is not a judgment seat for salvation, but rather a judgment seat of reward. There are a number of differences between this and the great white throne judgment, which make me believe this is a time prior to, uh, just just after the rapture, prior to the millennial kingdom, where I believe this fits. But 1 Corinthians 3, verse 10, Paul... He's, all, he's just been addressing some of that, that allegiance to different preachers. And then he says, verse 10, According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon, thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than is laid, that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire." And Paul there in 1 Corinthians is explaining to them that if a man's work is burned up, he'll suffer loss, but he'll be saved by fire. And I think that's why Paul said later on in 1 Corinthians in chapter 9, he had a desire to live for the Lord's glory and to lay up treasure in heaven. He said, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I've preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. I don't believe he was concerned he was going to lose his salvation, but rather he was going to lose reward at the Bema Seat Judgment if he built upon the foundation poorly um, in the flesh. But I think that's what's in view in verse 10 when he's he's praying for them that they would be sincere and without offence till the day of Christ, from now right through, that they would be growing and manifesting their spiritual reality in their external lives until Christ returns. And then lastly, verse 11, his last element of his prayer is that these believers would be filled with the fruits of righteousness. Filled with the fruits of righteousness. Filled means to... I looked up Strong's Concordance and there was an element there that I really liked. He said, to be crammed full as a net... I'm thinking about the fishermen dragging their nets in and the net is so full that it's crammed so much that you can't fit any more fish in. And saying that this word to be filled means to be crammed like a net or it means to be abounding or replete, overflowing. It's used to describe of levelling a hollow. So if you've got a hole in the ground, you fill it up so that there's no hole left to be filled. You say, well, that's pretty obvious. Filled with what? Well, the fruits of righteousness by Christ and to his glory. Paul may very well have been thinking about the fruits of the Spirit here, which is where my mind goes to, where he said to the Galatian believers, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And someone may say, and I hope none of you will, Pastor, I've been trying to fill my life with fruits of righteousness, but I don't seem to be doing a very good job. That's not the way it works. You can try and grow fruit in and of yourself. But the Bible here in Paul's prayer, he says that these fruits of righteousness are by Jesus Christ, that he bears them by his spirit in us. That's um, true when we as believers abide in the vine. And John 15 verse 4 talks about well, it's Jesus speaking to his disciples saying, abide in me and I in you. And as a, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. Um, so if you're trying to bear fruit without abiding in the vine, you won't. 
and you won't be able to fill yourself with it. But if you abide in the vine and abide in the Lord, he will bear in you much fruit so that you can boast. We talked about this this morning. What's the purpose of the, the fruits of righteousness filling the life of a believer? They're by him and they are for him unto his glory. And that's the, uh, the wonderful conclusion of his prayer. When he's praying for them, he says, I want you to be filled with the fruits of righteousness by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God, that our lives might live for his glory. It's a serious prayer, isn't it? I mean, I, I've been reminded in my own prayer life, praying for the folk of this church, for myself and my family, that there is more to pray for than... Lord, please bless. <laughs> um, Lord, please uh, provide. Lord, please care. I mean, there is, there is a depth of prayer that's seen here in Paul that, that I haven't reached in my life and I'm, I would like to grow. I'd like to be a person who prays like this. And if we focus on the big picture is that he's praying for their sanctification and growth in the areas of love and knowledge and discernment in the areas of testing and approving what is excellent and being filled with the, uh, being sincere and without blame or without offence. I, th- I believe that's before God and with others and being filled with the fruits of righteousness under His glory. What a, what a good prayer. I mean, we don't have to memorise it word for word. It's no good to go home and go, all right, let's say exactly what Paul said. But it would be very good for us to pull those elements out and go, how can I pray for my brothers and sisters in some of these ways this week. The purpose of our lives is to live for His glory. And Paul prays to that end. So when you pray for me, you can pray that the Lord would enable me to live for His glory. That's a good start. Or maybe you can pray that I might abound in love for the Lord and for the Lord's people, in love and in knowledge and discernment, also that I might be filled with the fruits of righteousness. Aren't they? They're they're wonderful phrases. Next time we pick up the book of Philippians and look from verse 12 and following, we will start to see Paul's circumstances and we will see a number of them which are from an earthly perspective negative. We would say, oh, Paul, I'd hate to be you. But I tell you what, Paul doesn't give you that impression. He rejoices in the, the circumstances in which he finds himself because the gospel is going forth in power. Um, He can see that God is doing something good in the midst of what he is enduring, and as such, he rejoices. And we'll look at that next time from verse 12. If you'd like to read ahead, that's where we will take up our series through the book of Philippians. We might close with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for our brief time tonight in your word, and I trust uh, for the challenge to to God's people, that we we need to be people of prayer. And I pray that you would help us to pray in ways similar to Paul, with a love for those we pray for and a desire to see them grow in their sanctification, that they may love more fully in in an abounding way, that they may, may be filled with the fruits of righteousness and that they may stand before you without... Uh, sincerely, with, without offence uh, at your coming. Lord, I pray that you might minister through your word, even as we go from this place, that we wouldn't just hear your word tonight and then forget, but we might hear and that the word of God might linger in our minds and that your spirit may recall it to our minds throughout this week. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.